Okay, good morning, everybody. Please open your Bibles to 1 John in chapter 5. <clears throat> Like to, I always like to publicly thank the Lord for the message and give him all the credit for the outline and the precious direction. He's uh, been merciful once again to give a precious precious uh, message about Christ's obedience unto righteousness. The title, Perfect Obedience Unto Righteousness, the acronym P-O-U-R. trying to turn my cell phone off here. The acronym Perfect Obedience Under Righteousness, or P O U R, is critical because it gives a clear definition of who is righteous and Christ works his perfection of living perfectly, fulfilling the law, and living uh, his life in a complete alliance, a, a, create, a complete agreement with God the Father shows that he's the righteous one to look to. That he alone is righteous, and the word the word pour <clears throat> means to pour uh, like a fluid or a liquid out of a container, and God's the Father's wrath was poured out on Christ, and at the same time that the righteous wrath, the goodly righteous wrath of God the Father was poured onto Christ as our substitute, Christ poured out his soul and his blood and his water and that is the heart of the message this morning that's the key point and that's perfect obedience unto righteousness <clears throat> but let's read here in first john and before i read chapter five of first john i want you to go to verse seven there's something that i learned when i was studying for this message that's not in the original greek bible if you read verse seven it says for there are three that bear record the rest of the words aren't in the Greek Bible. You draw an arrow down to verse 8. The spirit and the water and the blood and the, these three agree in one. The rest of those words don't appear in the Greek Bible at all. The, the person that translated added a lot of fluff about heaven and earth and these three things, and it's just not there at all. It's, I, I went over it multiple times. I was blown away. But if you draw a line straight, straight from the word record in verse 7, for there are not, I'm sorry, for th there are three that bear record, that record, draw a line with an arrow down to the spirit in verse 8. That's the original language, Greek, the original Bible. said uh, doesn't have all that other, those other words. There are a lot of precious words there, but they just don't happen to appear in the Greek Bible. So I've um, drawn an arrow in my Bible, and I recommend you do too. When I read through it, I'm just going to skip right through to, uh, to verse 8 there. So let's read chapter 5 of 1 John. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that believeth, or everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. The brethren love the brethren because Christ dwells within that other believer. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And we're going to be in this verse 4 quite a bit by the introduction, by way of introduction. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. <coughs> and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree inside Christ, inside one, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God, is, is greater for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his son he that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in in himself he that believeth not God 
hath made him a liar, has made God a liar, because he believed not the record that God gave his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Herein is the knowledge of eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. And here's something that's godly to pray. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Now, sin unto death is to walk away from the gospel. He says, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. You cannot walk away from the gospel if you're safe and secure in the blood of Christ. You can't do it. That's what this is saying in verse 18. But he that is begotten of God... God keeps himself. God keeps himself inside the believer. He'll never walk away. And that wicked one touches them not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given, this point number two, us an understanding. You will actually have an understanding when you're saved, that we may know him that is true. And we are in him, that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. So I wanted to, I was going to try to abbreviate some of these readings this morning, and I just had to read all that, that chapter 5. It's just awesome. But the main, the main points are here in your outline, rest on the finished work of Christ. And point number two is going to be understand that God the Father poured out his wrath upon Christ in your place. That's the wisdom and understanding that God gives his people. Right inside their mind, they grasp that it was done for them. That work of Christ on the cross of Calvary was done for them particularly. So by way of introduction, can man keep God's commandments? This First John chapter 5, and if uh, I want to remind you now, keep your hand here, keep a bookmark here, because we're going to come back in this message frequently to 1 John 5. But it says, can a man keep God's commandments? Look at verse 13 with me. Those things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you believe. It's keeping God's commandments is a single action here in the Word belief to actually grasp and to believe that Christ is the Son of God this is the fulfillment of all because Christ kept the law for you Christ kept the commandments perfectly don't look to you keeping the law look to the one that kept it for you that belief that resting that relying on Christ is completely keeping the commandments look at verse 3 for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. This is to rest on the finished work of Christ on your behalf. Hebrews 4 9 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. God promises that his people will rest their guilty conscience on Christ's substitutionary work. They'll no longer think that they can save themselves based on their works. They'll say, Christ paid my debt for me, and they'll know it. In their inner conscience, they'll say, it's finished. I don't have anything left to do because Christ did it for me. He paid the eternal torment of sin for me. I don't have to do anything. It's not my works that recommends me before God. It's Christ's works on my behalf that recommends me before God. This is what it is to keep God's commandments, to rest on the one that kept it for you, Christ. Hebrews 4.10 says, For he that has entered into his rest... That's Christ's rest. He also has ceased from his own works. Every one of God's people in their lifetime ceased from doing works of their own self-righteousness. In the day of salvation, they say, I'm not going to do those things anymore. They're filth before God. They do no service 
to saving my soul. God says it's not even a means of salvation. Man's works won't be received by God. We forego that and we stop doing our own works just like God did from his. On God, the seventh day, God sat down in creation. He literally sat down and rested the whole seventh day. Why? To show everyone it's done. He proclaimed that seventh day by his rest that the work of salvation was completely accomplished in his dear son. His son agreed to save his people with his blood, and God the Father said it will be done. Christ sat down on the seventh day of creation, and so do every one of his people. We sit down in Christ sitting down. We rest on his finished work before the foundation of the world, not on the works of man. How can we do something now to actually justify ourselves before God? He said it was done before the foundation of the world. It's done. Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. If you believe and rest on Christ's finished work, you're a believer. And there's no more law for you to do because Christ's righteousness declares that the law is fulfilled in him. And you look to him for your justification. He kept the law for us. So how does one know that Christ kept the law for you? How do you know that? Romans 4, 8 says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Some he imputes sin to. When Adam fell, everybody fell guilty of that original sin that says, I hate God, I want my own way. I won't yield to resting on the finished work of Christ. I'm going to figure out my own means of salvation and have my own free will to cast my own means to justify myself before God. God won't have that. God says, blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute that sin to. So it's God's will, God's choice to impute his son's righteousness to whom he will. In our text here this morning, verse 4 says, For, who, for whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Overcomes the world. The world is the flesh, the devil, and all the means of self-justification. You... There's a means to overcome all this that God provides. It's to rest on the finished work of Christ. Only God can give you that mindset and that ability to rest there. Until then, you'll rest in your own moral acts or your own career path or your own anything. You, there's something that you have inside yourself that you're resting on that is from your father Adam and it is outside of Christ delivering you it's another means. It's a wicked means. It's a dark means. It's something other than the blood and righteousness of Christ. And by God's grace, he'll reveal that to you in the day of salvation, and you'll no longer rest on that self-righteous that self -righteous works. And you're going to have you're going to overcome the world. You're going to be given to overcome because you're going to take on Christ's righteousness as your only justification before the Father. Turn to Matthew 11, please. What is to rest on the finished work of Christ? Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So there's a revelation by God alone. Man can't work our way to salvation. God has to reveal to you that you're safe and secure in the Son of God. And he says what's going to happen when this happens. In verse 28, you're going to come to him because you're going to be given a new mind to see that all the things that you used to do to justify yourself before God are filth. And you're going to say that I'm full of heavy labors and I'm heavy laden and I need rest. I need to rest in something besides my works because you won't receive my works. That's what 28 says in verse 29. says, Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, Christ. Learn of Christ, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Christ is righteous in and of himself. He's holy God in human flesh. He's the means of salvation, and he's truly the one to rest in. He's the one that sat down on the seventh day of creation and said, It's finished. I accomplished salvation for my people, and it's, they're all safe and secure in me. This is where you find safe and security for your souls, not in your works, in Christ's work. He says in verse 30, for my yoke, it's easy. 
My burden is light. Why? Because he's absorbed all the wrath of the Father and the Father received his work and he was resurrected. And all there is left for you now is his righteous holiness. This is a light burden. This is what you need if you're a sinner. You need to be shown that your yoke is light because Christ bore your burden in your place. Back to our text, please. First John chapter five. We're talking about overcoming the world. Verse four, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What is it? Faith. It's right there in verse four. Faith. Faith means to believe. Faith means to rest. Faith means to trust that Christ accomplished salvation for you. This is true salvation. It's, it's not a works of man. If, if man had something to contribute to salvation, we'd boast about it before God and actually try to steal the, the credit for salvation away from God Almighty. And he won't share the credit of salvation with anybody. Not one person will share the credit of salvation. It all goes, all the credit goes to Christ alone. He says about Abraham, if Abraham were justified by works, he could glory in it, but not before God Almighty. There's no way nobody will justify themselves and glorify in that before God. God won't have it. Anybody that comes to God in their judgment day and says, I'm self-righteous, accept this offering. Other than Christ's work, depart from me, ye that work inequity. He won't have it. He says in Ephesians 2, 8, by grace are you saved through faith. It's not even of yourself. Faith is a gift of God. Man cannot boast that we figured out faith and we offered God faith and then he saved us. Baloney. God gives the faith exclusively. He gives you to rest on and to believe that Christ died for you particularly. Turn to Revelations chapter 3. Revelation 3 and verse 21 is the, the sitting down in Christ's righteousness, sitting down on the works of Christ, resting on the finished work of Christ exclusively. Revelation 3, 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. Christ is seated right now in heaven on the throne of God the Father, accepted because all his righteous works are good and acceptable by the Father. He's seated right now. This is where you need to sit. This is where you need to rest, not on your supposed righteousness. Sit down on the finished work of Christ. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. The Spirit of God inside the elect sinner says, I'm going to rest on Christ's work. I'll have no more of my own works. That's fearful and I fear death in that state. I don't want anything to do with that anymore. I want to rest on the finished work of Christ. He's accepted in heaven right now. That's where I want to be. That's what the spirit of the church says inside their heads, inside their bodies. I'm resting on the finished work of Christ. Back now to 1 John again. <clears throat> in chapter 5. Look at verse 6 with me. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. The spirit of God inside a sinner says, I'm going to rest on Christ's work. There's no other means of salvation other than through Christ. The, the ungodly spirit, the damned spirit says, I have a way to justify myself before God. And it doesn't have to do with Christ or I can add to Christ's work. That, that's wicked, that's ungodly. The true Christ beareth witness inside his people and says, I'm going to rest on Christ's work. Turn to John 15 with me, please. John chapter 15. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit that God gives his people. It's right in our brains. Nothing fancy about it. He puts in our brain the Holy Spirit. John 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of Christ. Rest on the finished work of Christ. Brag on Christ's righteousness. 
rely that Christ did it for me. This is true salvation, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. When I sat down that seventh day, I had you in mind. You fell in Adam, but I had you in mind to come and to live for you and put you back in my body, die on the cross of Calvary for you, and be resurrected and put you right in heaven again. You were right there with me from the beginning. You're an elect. Christ didn't die for everybody. If he died for every single person of all existence, every one of us is safe in heaven right now. There's souls in hell. He didn't die for all. He, he accomplished salvation for his sheep exclusively, and he accomplished it perfectly. And the Father accepts us all because of the finished work of Christ on our behalf. Turn to Romans 8, please. Another two precious verses in Romans 8, verse 15. <laughs> Before salvation, we feared death, didn't we? That's the lever Satan had on us. If you don't do this, you'll go to hell. If you don't do that, you'll go to hell. So there you are, doing works of supposed self-righteousness to try to justify yourself before God, and you're a prisoner to it. You're a slave to it. That's all you know. That's all you do. And tell the spoken word in verse 15 of Romans 8, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, you're not walking around in fear of death anymore. Death's been paid for you. Christ died on your behalf. It's all gone. The wrath of the Father's been quenched, satisfied, answered, and God the Father accepted it. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We've been adopted. We were fatherless for all those years. And then Christ revealed... We're adopted. We're put back in good standing with God the Father, all based on Christ's work. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know inside your body you're safe and secure, and there's no more trembling at the fear of death and condemnation. Because Christ paid it. It's gone. It's satisfied. Back to our text again in verse, chapter 5 of 1 John. <clears throat> now look at verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us to understand. This is point number two. Point number one this morning was to rest on the finished work of Christ. If you didn't hear that, I just went over it about 20 times. Rest on the finished work of Christ. The second point this morning is understand that God the Father poured out his wrath on his Son. And this understanding is salvation. To understand this and to grasp it is to actually have the mind of God Almighty. The word understand in, in the original Greek language is mind. He says, have the mind of God to grasp these things. So he puts in the mind of his saints to see that God the Father poured out all his righteous wrath on his Son. And in Christ's body, only goodness only righteousness, God in human flesh, but the wrath of the Father was poured into Christ on the cross. And at the same time that that wrath was being poured into Christ and Christ was being tormented in our place, going through all that anguish for us, Christ poured out his holy blood and his holy water and his Holy Spirit. And that's the next three subpoints of the message this morning. Christ as our substitute came and actually was punished in our place. He answered the demand of the law that says the soul that sins, it shall die. God didn't bypass his justice. He poured out his justice on our substitute. He reconciled that wicked sin and his holy wrath inside his son on our behalf. As our substitute, there's three attributes of Christ that are in our text of chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. First, this morning, the Spirit, this attribute of Christ was shown to Mary, the virgin woman that asked the angel that said, you're going to have a child. And she said, how can I? I've never been with a man. The answer was, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee, therefore also... That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. 
what that angel proclaimed to Mary that day was that the Father Spirit is the very Spirit inside Christ. The Father Spirit made Christ. This is the Spirit that was inside Christ while He was on this earth, substitutionarily dying for His people. The Holy Spirit of the Father was inside Christ. Also the water, the water in the Scripture is the Word. It's in Ephesians 5.26. He says that, that the church might be sanctified or made whole and cleansed with it. The washing of the water by the Word. The Word of God is very water inside Christ. Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit from the Father. He was filled with water, the Word of God. That's, that's what was inside Christ on the cross of Calvary. And then the blood, the blood of Christ. Turn to John 19. These three holy attributes of Christ were in Him and the cross of Calvary, and He poured all three of them out while the wrath of the Father was being poured into Him on your behalf. If you're ever to know Him savingly, this is what He went through for you. John 19, verse 33, But when they came to Jesus and saw that his, He was dead already, they break down His legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced His side. Forthwith came there out blood and water. There, there they are the very good attributes, God attributes of Christ, the water, the word, and the blood came out. And he that saw it bear record, and his record's true. And he know, knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe on this water and this blood that poured out of Christ in your place. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone shall not be broken of Christ. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him who they pierced. If you are dead in Christ and alive in him now, you know that it's your sin that pierced him. It's you. You're the problem. You're full of sin. You're full of iniquity. You fell in Adam, and it's you who pierced Christ. You're the reason why that blood and that water had to be poured out of him. And he poured it out. He didn't hold anything back. Christ gave every bit of his Holy Spirit his holy water and his holy blood for his elect. At the same time, the Father was pouring in his wrath. Christ was pouring out these three attributes and the Father received them. He received all three and he judged them as good and righteous holy God and he accepted it. <clears throat> this is the wrath of God being poured out on his people. The soul that sinneth that shall die had to be answered and he did answer it in Christ. God made Christ to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? All he was was perfect Holy Spirit, perfect Holy Water or Word, and perfect Holy Blood. Yet he laid down all three of those things and poured them out of his body that we'd go free. That the sinner and the God-hater would be freed. That's what Christ did on our behalf. Zephaniah, it's awesome. He says, I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men. And because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust. God's going to pulverize every other means of salvation other than Christ. He's going to destroy it. Don't go before God in, at the end of your life thinking that you can justify yourself. Your blood's going to be pounded like dust before him. Because he doesn't accept man's blood. He only accepts his son's blood. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day the Lord's wrath comes upon you. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. Everyone shall be judged by God's jealous wrath. May it be that you are judged in Christ. May it be Christ took your judgment for you. This is all that really matters. Ezekiel 36, 18 says, Wherefore I poured my fury upon them from the blood that they had shed upon the land and of their idols wherewith they had polluted it. You put a false blood before God Almighty, you'll perish in your sin. He won't accept it. Christ on our behalf took his holy blood and poured it out for us in our place. And God the Father accepted it. Ezekiel 22, 22 says, As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be heated in the midst thereof. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. This is specifically the Father talking to the Son. You'll know I'm pouring out my fury upon you for mine elect, I'm going to pour out all my fury upon you. And he did it. God made Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin. He accomplished the salvation 
through Christ's work on the cross of Calvary. He poured out his fury like fire on Christ. Turn to Nahum. We don't go to the book of Nahum very often. Book of Nahum, please. Toward the end of the Old Testament. Nahum in chapter 1 talks about God's jealous wrath. Nahum chapter 1 verse 2, God's jealous. The Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great to, in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. God is just and righteous. He won't let anyone that's a sinner go free. He will punish all sinners. May it be that you are punished, that Christ was punished for you in your place. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, maketh it dry. Verse 5, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell there. And when God's presence comes on this earth, it's going to turn into flames. He is holy and righteous, and he won't have anything around him unless it's holy and righteous also. If it's not, it's going to torch into flames. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in this fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord's good and a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trusteth in him. There's the elect. There's those that trust in Christ and rest on Christ's finished work, and we're safe and secure in Christ. But all those that don't rest on Christ, over, overwhelming flood will he make an utter end of the place thereof. And the darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Anything that you imagine to justify yourself before God that isn't Christ's work on your behalf, he's going to make an end of it. And the affliction shall not rise up the second time. That's because it's going to be eternal upon you. Unless Christ died for you, you will eternally perish. He only accepts the work of his son. Now turn to Psalm 18, please. When Christ was on the cross at Calvary, dying for his people, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was absorbing all that righteous, holy wrath of God the Father for his people. And he was forsook by God the Father. God the Father was pummeling him with righteous fire and wrath in our place. The mountains were quaking at that time. Psalm 18, verse 4. Sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. This is Christ being tormented for you if you're ever to know him. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him, even unto his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. Foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken, because he was wroth. There went up smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth, devoured coals and kindled by, by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. God the Father came down when Christ was on the cross of Calvary and killed him, tortured him, pummeled him with his wrath for us. Because he, Christ, was the Lamb of God the Father that was sent to buy us back on the cross of Calvary. Now, last, last passage is Matthew 27. This is Jesus on the cross of Calvary, Matthew 27. He cried when the Father was tormenting him. Christ cried out loud on the cross. Verse 50 in Matthew 27. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. Check it out. God the Father accepting Christ's spirit, Christ's blood, and Christ's water, the word inside Christ. That was all poured out for his people. And he accepted it. And he opened the graves. Many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose, came out of the graves after Christ's resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. God the Father accepted Christ's work on the cross of Calvary. All his goodness, all his righteousness that Christ poured out in death, God the Father held in his hand and said, I accept it. 
I accept Christ and I'm resurrecting him because in him is only goodness. And now my righteous wrath has been paid for. It's been absorbed in Christ and now I'm going to resurrect my son showing that I accept the sacrifice that I set before the foundation of the world as true and good and able to save my people from their sins. And we're free in him and we're resurrected in him. We're in heaven right now in Christ, safe and secure. And that's the point of the message. Verse 13 of our text. It's in the bottom of your outline. That ye may know that you have eternal life. If you're resting on Christ's finished work, if you have that godly understanding in your brain that you see that he died for you and he went to hell for you, and he was resurrected for you, you've got eternal life. You're resting on the finished work of Christ. You're not trying to present your righteous works before God anymore. You're resting on Christ's work for you. And everything that Christ accomplished, it satisfies you. And you're resting therein. And that's my prayer to everybody here, is that you rest on the finished work of Christ, and you know that personally he died for you.